Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, your host. Today, we're going to talk about the view from the north with uh, Dr. Ken Rogers, uh, who is in Kelowna, British Columbia. And he happens to be there as our man on the ground, our man on the ground today, because he's in the middle of a, a ring of, uh, of fires. We're talking about wildfires now, and uh, certainly we have learned about them in Maui, but we are going to learn about them elsewhere as well. I was watching um, my regular dose of YouTube the other day, and lo and behold, there were half a dozen videos there, all an hour old. Um, about the fires around your home, your town, your uh, lake. And, uh, and I called you because I, I was concerned uh, that fires these days can be very dangerous. So um, tell us what's going on. This year, Canada's had about approximately 1,000 forest fires. Now, in scale, you know, the Canadian forest fires are really huge. You know, for example, um, there's one fire still going in uh, one corner of British Columbia, the province I live in, that's um, a, a little over um, 2,300 square miles. Like that's square miles. And if you take that by comparison, you know, um, Maui is about 700 square miles and Oahu is about 600 square miles, and Kauai is about 532 square miles. Well, if you added those together, the three islands total are smaller than the one fire. That fire is kind of being ignored uh, because it's in a remote location as opposed to uh, there are, uh, you know, several fires getting a lot of attention very close to where I live. Uh, for example, one that uh, uh, I noticed, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, even met, made, made some international news, <laughs> was uh, called West Kelowna. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, perhaps because the flames were quite spectacular when you have Canadian wildfires, they're, they're in these... Um, evergreen forests or bo boreal forests and so that the uh, you know the flames uh, really uh, uh, are dominant uh, particularly uh, when uh, you get enough heat uh, some of these evergreens uh, do what's called candling you know in case you don't know what candling means uh, the evergreen tree starts to burn uh, you know, usually from near the bottom, but um, at, eventually it creates its own wind straight vertically. And the wind is strong enough that if the tree is, uh, say, 150 feet high, um, it'll suck up all of the uh, needles like pine needles or spruce needles, usually they're evergreen type trees, and suck those needles uh, straight up in the air, plus strip a bunch of the needles off of the tree and shoot them up about three times the height of the tree. So if the tree's, you know, 150 feet high, it, it might go up another four, you know, 450 feet above that. Well, then whatever direction the wind is blowing, it'll just blow those uh, burning embers, uh, what, you know, wherever the wind will take them. Where I live, uh, there was a, uh, a fire in a uh, mountain valley uh, to the west of, um, of where I live. And uh, the flames rolled up to the top of that mountain coming towards where I live. Uh, well, the downslope, the other side of that mountain happens to be across the lake from where I am. And uh, and it gets it's inhabited much like uh, you know the mountains in Hawaii, where you have uh, the housing starts to go up the slope. No, you, they're nowhere near the top of these, you know, five or six thousand foot high old mountains. But the old mountains are covered with uh, just you know absolutely solid with evergreen trees. 
And so, uh, you know, as this fire started to come down the slope towards the developed area, you know, all of the um, uh, fire uh, prevention resources were already in place. You know, one of the things Canada's really good at is how how fast uh, the fire suppression uh, equipment can be in place, uh, particularly water bombers. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, they kind of break the the fire crews into two types, one that deals with the fire and, and one, the second one that deals only with property protection, um, like a local fire department kind of thing. And uh, anyhow, this, uh, this fire uh, started to churn away while well, it's run for about a week. Uh, now it expanded about, um, oh, 12 miles north from the fire where I live, let's say straight east of the fire. Um, and the, um, you know, that was sort of along the mountain ridge uh, that it expanded. And then in a couple of spots, it, the fire decided to go down towards the lake and, and in so doing, uh, wiped out a few um, multi-million dollar lakeshore houses. <laughs> But uh, not not too many compared to Maui, uh, yeah, and Maui um, uh, Lahaina. In your Lahaina fire, you know, you you have a very small area, and it's totally different than the kind of fires that we have here locally or generally in Canada. Uh, you know, the you know key thing to the Maui fire is uh, you know you'll have the human factor is a much, much bigger uh, cause factor than it is for the types of fires that we have here. Um, you know, and I don't just mean who who provided the ignition. You know, if you have lots of people, it's more likely that the fire got ignited by some human factor, like somebody dropped a cigarette or at a careless campfire or or the equivalent, you know, where most fires in Canada are caused by lightning, you know, like three quarters of them nationwide are caused by lightning. But in um, most areas, uh, you know, it's the, it's the only cause because there aren't very many people. How close has it gotten to you? So it got down to the lake. It destroyed some properties along the lake, the lakeside. You know these uh, embers uh, in in your direction, and uh, so how threatened are you? Uh, not really. You know the fire crews are pretty spectacular here. They've had a lot of practice, though. You know, and I don't just mean uh, you know the local fire department. They have had lots of practice, but um, but within um, you know just a few hours. There was at least, um, you know, 400 uh, firefighters from other communities in British Columbia that were already working on this fire, you know, and, and they're, those firefighters, the local ones, were all oriented towards protecting property as opposed to, you know, there were national type firefighters you know, with water bombers and and large equipment um, for, you know, pumps and that sort of thing that were oriented to to the actual uh, wire, wildfire itself. But again, they focused on the burning that was nearest to any property. Well, in terms of my location, I'm, you know, at least five miles from the nearest flame. You know, but most of the fire moved um, northward from where it started. And so let's say today that West Kelowna fire is about 50 square miles, where the whole Lahaina fire was perhaps four square miles. This is long and skinny, and it's mainly on, you know, uh, rugged mountains, uh, you know, three or 4,000 feet. Uh, uh, elevation above where I live. <laughs> I've uh, seen um, videos of these things called 
super scoopers. Uh, I don't know if they're in use in that part of Canada, but what what happens is the the plane um, is a um, it, it kind of flies down along the surface of a lake and opens its uh, scoopers, and it scoops up uh, like fifteen hundred gallons of water in a matter of seconds, and it flies up over the fire and drops that in a matter of seconds, and so it keeps on making that loop and is able to drop an enormous amount of water on a fire all within a few minutes. Uh, have you heard about the, the level of technology they're using in these, these water dumper planes? At least half a dozen of them working on the West Kelowna fire alone. Um, a second item that the aircraft does is, is they drop fire retardant, which in a lot of ways is is even better than the water bombers because they, um, uh, you know, if you've seen pictures of of uh, of the aftermath of a fire, you'll find buildings that are still standing covered with what looks like orange dust, <laughs> you know, as if they'd been in a dust storm, and that is really the fire retardant, and it is really good stuff for preventing a fire to spread. So the air support is is pretty important, but but when you really stand back, uh, Mother Nature is a lot stronger than than man. Let's talk about Mother Nature. I mean, somebody, namely humanity, has offended Mother Nature with climate change, um, and now um, you know there are there are fires all over the world. It's not just the uh, American um, Northwest and uh, the Canadian Northwest. It's, Maybe all over Canada, I guess, and um, and then of course you have uh, you know Latin America has fires, Africa has fires, Europe has fires, and Russia has a ton of fires. Um, so you know it, it's not like it only happened this year. It's been increasing dramatically over the last uh, two, three, four years, even the last ten or twenty years, and uh, we put them out, but then climate change lights them up again. You spoke of like three separate kinds of fires um, by by way of the origin of the fire uh, that, that happened in uh, you know in Canada. What are those three? One you mentioned is the boreal fire. What are the others? You have um, like Hawaii. I call that uh, you know tropical jungle, uh, and uh, and really the um, role that the humans have played in the tropical fires is far greater than the other two. You know, for example, in Maui, it would be my opinion, it may not be fully correct, but uh, most of uh, the Hawaiian islands uh, that does not have jungle on it, the jungle was cleared by uh, someone that wanted to put together a plantation. And so you had these large plantations for, for a long time. And then, you know, it was economic that people abandoned these uh, plantations. Well, when the plantations were there, you know, they were well irrigated uh, so that, you know, there's really, they weren't causing fires any differently than as if the jungle was there. You know, most people would say the jungle just doesn't burn. You know, that's not quite right because, you know, you can take the Lahaina example uh, is, in my opinion, you get to when these uh, uh, plantations were abandoned, you know, they were replaced generally with some grazing land or simply abandoned period. And you had plants that weren't even native to Maui or or the islands that, that grew in place of the old jungle. You know, so you have grasses in particular. Well, grasses, you know, when you're in a dry climate and, you know, the dry side of every one of the Hawaiian islands is really dry, you know, so that you have these grasses that, uh, you know, burn very, very easily. It takes very little ignition to... Uh, create a fire uh, you know you can have simple thing like you know if the wind blows and it blows down a telephone wire uh, 
you know, that wire can ignite it. In Canada, we had an interesting fire in a place called Lytton, burnt down this whole little, you know, village of about, you know, 100 homes uh, because a, uh, a train was, you know, going around the corner and it happened to be a day where we had a heat dome and it was a, a bit over 40 degrees in this town. And so this train went by and and I guess the tracks sparked uh, some nearby grass or nearby foliage of some sort. And a few minutes later, the whole town was gone. The cause in, in Maui, you really get, um, you've changed the foliage. And so you have something that would ignite that fire. Uh, and then, you know, those grass fires move away quicker than you can run. I mean, if you think of, you know, a normal wind, you know, 30 miles an hour or something, you know, where you'd say, gee, that's a breezy day. Uh, where in, in the uh, Lahaina case, you were sitting with a, you, a hurricane not too far away that was causing much stronger winds than that. Well, you know, you just, you know, if you're running, or let's say if you're walking, you walk maybe three miles an hour, you know, maybe four if you're a fast walker. Well, how fast can you run if it's a, you know, 60 mile an hour wind blowing the fire along grass that burns pretty instantly? You, you know, you have no chance whatsoever. You you can just pray. You can, well, uh, much like the, the fire in West Kelowna and Lahaina, you know, in left west Kelowna, they jumped in the lake you know some of them in these you know large houses that were caught by surprise uh, that the fire got down to their lakeshore house but you know in lahaina just they had nowhere else to go some people you jumped know, in the ocean you know we saw in the international news of you know pretty spectacular efforts to rescue the people that were getting floated out to sea <laughs> That cause of the fire, you know, is is so different. Um, you know, in, in California, your types of fire in Southern California are very much um, different than the ones in Canada or in, in Maui or the Amazon, because they're dealing with uh, mainly um, shrubbery. You know, so that they, they have combinations of grass, shrubbery, and a variety of trees. And so that their fires uh, are very different in nature, but they also cover pretty large areas similar to the Canadian fires. Of course, it's clear that climate change is getting worse. And, and the wildfires are getting worse. Um, and um, they're appearing in more places. These three kinds of fires you described, the boreal fire, fire um, the jungle fire, or the grassland fire, it's really the same thing, and, and call it the California fire. Um, but uh, you know, this is very, very troublesome because it's destroying a, a lot of property, destroying a lot of forest land, um, and you know, generally mm, popping up everywhere. Uh, it's not as if this is a surprise, because if you look at the maps of the of the wildfires over the past 10 or 20 years, you can see it's been happening and just worse every year. And, I mean, it's pretty threatening to Canada because Canada is has got a lot of woods. It's a lot of, um, you know, heavy woods, especially in the West. What can we do uh, to to, you know, protect ourselves? Uh, you talk about uh, how dividing the uh, firefighters into two groups, but I didn't hear a group about you know how to protect the area, protect the forest from the fire. Is there anything can be done? You have things that have been done in the past that have made the situation worse. You know, you kind of need to look at history first to decide what was done wrong. Um, well, the the simplest item of what was done wrong is if you're taking the um, uh, majority of the CO2 that's been pumped into the air has come from, you know, what I call the jungle fires, you know, the Amazon, the Congo, 
kind of thing. Now, those are nearly all purposely lit by, lit by humans. They are not lightning costs. Like in Canada, virtually uh, in, in the um, heavily populated areas of Canada, you know, you're sitting with about three quarters of the fires are caused by lightning and one quarter by people. But in the rest of Canada, it's almost none by people. It's all by lightning. Canada has about 3,000 fires so far this year. The uh, Brazil, which is only 60% of the Amazon, has had about 4,000 fires already this year. But virtually every one of those was lit or human caused purposely. You know, the, the lumbering activity, they'll cut down the lumber to create a farmland and then they'll burn the lumber. They're all, you know, smaller so they can get away, you know, like small, maybe, you know, a couple square miles kind of thing. Um, because that's the piece of land that somebody wants to have for grazing or something of that sort, rather than then leave it as Amazon jungle. Um, so the first item there is, you know, you, you've got to have methods by which you can control those illegal logging in the Amazon or the Congo or, you know, let's call it the Congo Basin uh, or the Amazon Basin. Um, and, uh, and you need a way to enforce that. That would be one simple item. When you get to areas like the uh, Maui situation, you know, you have to have an increase in the capital provided for infrastructure. You know, it, it can't be left to the, you know, town of Lahaina to suddenly have, you know, all the electric wires that lead near to that city, you know, being not well maintained and all above ground um you know the um you need to put those wires underground you know you don't need them underground in the middle of the city but you certainly do you know on the areas that lead to the city and and in the maui scenario you know if you accept my hypotheses that the you know uh, abandoned uh, lands, or they're not necessarily abandoned, but it used to be um, uh, used for growing pineapple or the equivalent and uh, plantation. Yeah, and sugar, maybe sugar a little cane grazing. Mostly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But then now those lands, uh, you know, probably the person that's owning is sitting there, uh, you know, rubbing their hands, waiting for somebody to propose a, you know, a, a real estate development of some sort, uh, but they're not really worried about mitigating fire. You know, where how does the the state, uh, you know, or the federal government require lands that are in those situations, um, you know, that are a, really a danger to any population that's anywhere nearby um, the, to, you know, change that land use. You know, you have to have something done differently than is done there. You talked about um, this uh, kind of spiral effect. Um, so, you know, we know that um, these illegal fires you're talking about in um, in the Amazon and uh, in the Congo um, are really bad for climate change because they destroy the tropical vegetation um, and, they, and they wind up uh, creating a whole scenario um, to uh, to stop the benefit of the jungle in terms of uh, protecting against climate change. Creating exactly the scenario that caused the Maui fire. <laughs> yes. Um, and to say nothing about, um, you know, the, the flora and the fauna and, and the animal life that is destroyed in the process. But, you know, when you talk about large acres, uh, you know, thousands of miles of fire, and all of that is spewing carbon in the atmosphere. It sounds like a spiral, a cycle to me. So here you have climate change as a big cause of these fires. 
Um, and then you have the fires themselves contribute in very substantial ways to exacerbate the climate change. Your thoughts? I can use a Canadian example of a, of a uh, super uh, feeding loop <laughs> where the, uh, if you take in, in Canada, one of the fires that has made a lot of news uh, is in the Northwest Territories, which is, you know, miles and miles and miles from, from nowhere. You know, the, the capital city in the Northwest Territories is is pretty small in the sense of, you know, 22,000 population. But uh, it has one road that you can get to that place from. Otherwise, you got to go by air. And, you know, that, for example, is is to the nearest big city, you know, is about 16 hour drive. You know, it's not any short stint. Well, they have a very large fire that was, you know, about 25 miles from that city. This is and the Yellow Knife, it, Yellow Knife fire. Yes, yeah, and it was blowing towards Yellow Knife. Um, and, uh, you know, they just you know, evacuated the whole city. But what I'm talking about, the feedback loop, is that, um, when you're that far north, you have permafrost, and the trees grow in the ground above the permafrost. So if you have um, global warming, you know, which you know makes the trees drier, cre uh, you know, creates a longer drought period, and you know, you also have uh, dry lightning, and so you start this fire, but the fire cleans off the trees and exposes the ground to the future sun more easily, but also it melts a bunch of the permafrost. Well, the permafrost holds the, I think it, the permafrost in Canada and Russia alone contain uh, something like 10 times the amount of carbon that's now in the atmosphere. I remember hearing about that. And so when the permafrost melts, uh, it releases methane. Uh, and uh, the, methane, the methane is the worst possible uh, gas for uh, exacerbating climate change. Well, methane, um, if you were sitting in a chemistry lab, you'd say, well, gee, the, the methane would increase global global it's 28 times as potent as a uh, as CO2 but that's not really the whole story because the CO2 stays there a long time where the methane it really has uh, it only goes 10 10 years so that it really is several hundred times as potent in that short period um, and and so it, it really is a problem. Well, when you have these fires and you're melting the permafrost by fires or simply by the global warming in the first place, you know, if you go far enough north, you no longer can grow the trees. Like, you know, Greenland and Alaska and northern Canada and, and northern Russia, you know, the, uh, are all in the same scenario. Well, at that the permafrost, when it starts to melt, it forms the ground sinks and it forms little pools of lakes everywhere, like they're miniature lakes. You may have seen pictures of them as you'd, you'd say, what a weird landscape. You have just these pools of lakes going on and on and on as far as you can see. Well, you know, the methane just bubbles out of those. And, and, you know, some of the um, newscasts will show somebody in, in northern Canada or Greenland and uh, one of these areas, and they'll, you know, pull out a match or a, a lighter just to show that these bubbles that are coming out will burn right? mm -hmm. as they're bubbling out of the water. Um, and, and that is all methane that's bubbling out. In Canada, there, there are firefighters. In Canada, you have the ability um, to, you know, stop the fire, protect uh, human habitation, uh, limit the fire. 
but in Russia, huge landmass, um, they have a lot of fires there. And um, those fires are uncontrolled because Russia does not have the resources, the firefighters, the equipment, what have you, the ability to get there in the hinterland to stop those fires. So in a sense, am I right? Russia must be contributing to this process more than any other country. And indeed, it is global. And one country can really not affect what another country is doing uh, to limit um, the fires. You're not correct in the sense of Canada being able to control. You know, our controllability is in the southern part of Canada, kind of like the, the city where I live. And, and there is a fairly significant ability to control the fire that is right across the lake from me. But I'll go in, in two steps and, and say, you know, the one in the Northwest Territories near Yellowknife essentially has nobody tending it at all. It's just Mother Nature's in charge because there's no way they can get enough people there to do anything with it. Well, about um, 50 miles north of where I live, you know, um, in fact, there's a very, very famous tourist area, you know, a thing called the Adams River Run. It has the world's largest salmon run. You know, the salmon run up this river to where if, if you pick you know, every seventh year or whenever the, the run is at its greatest, you know, you could you could feel like you could walk across this large river because it's just that full of salmon moving upstream. You know, that, that's called the Adams River. It's really a short little river running from a thing called Adams Lake. Well, this Adams Lake had a fire that started in early July. Well, there were fire crews working on it, but not very much because it was not too close to too many people. You know, the, the crews were trying to work where there was a population problem, where you might burn somebody's buildings. Well, because the West Kelowna fire got a bunch of attention a week ago, roughly, or maybe 10 days ago when the West Kelowna fire really had a, a ridiculous north wind that caused, you know, or wind that caused this problem to expand. Well, the fire to the north, the Adams Lake one, suddenly that fire moved 20 miles in 12 hours. And you had all kinds of fantastic lakeshore property on what are called the Shushwap Lakes in in, the, in central British Columbia. Just gorgeous, uh, you know, country. Like if you were a fisherman, you'd think, "Well, this is heaven type of place." Um, and um, and that fire expanded, and suddenly you have uh, you know an awful lot of people screaming. How come all of their fire protection got sent to West Kelowna? You know, so so really, you you have Canada cannot beat off Mother Nature. Now, to put your Russia Canada thing in perspective, uh, the Russia is about one and a half times the size of Canada. The this year's fires in Canada are producing more CO2 than the Canadian economy does. You know, when people say, how much does each country cough out in CO2? You know, when, when they list Canada or Brazil, they don't count fires. You know, they count how much comes from automobiles and how much comes from your electric generation plants. Well, well, our our CO two from fires this year is about one and a half times, and that's the fires so far of all of the CO two produced by our economy, and and Canada's about the seventh largest economy in the world. We're probably the our economy probably produces about the tenth most CO two. 
you know, the, there's ones like Saudi Arabia that produce more than us, but they're not not as big an economy. However, <clears throat> anyhow, Russia, um, which is about one and a half times Canada, but they produce three times as much CO2 from their fires as Canada does. So you've got two of the 10 biggest economies in the world you know, where everybody talks about how, you know, we ought to convert to electric automobiles and so on, you know, but those two economies are coughing out way, way more CO2 from the fires. And I would suspect that the trop the tropical fires, it, like the Amazon basin, that I would suspect that the CO2 from the fires in Brazil uh, also put more CO2 in the atmosphere than does the economy of Brazil, which is not much different than the, than the size of the economy in Russia or Canada. Uh, you know, the, the, the tropical forests, um, when they burn, they produce more CO2 than, the, than a square mile of, of boreal forest does. This is more carbon material. Well, anyway, it, it strikes me that um, you have more fires um, and that the fires are actually in a spiral way um, exacerbating climate change and each one feeds the other. And as time goes by, we will see more fires all around the world and more climate change, uh, you know, creating more fires. Uh, and uh, there is really no international cooperation on putting them out. Although I imagine firefighters from the U.S. will go help in Canada and vice versa, but in, there's no organization. The United Nations is not heavily involved in this, and so we really have a problem here. And you revealed that um, today, Ken. So it's it's very important. It's important that we uh, compare notes about how how this happens in Canada, how it happens in the U.S. and uh, in Latin America, Africa, and of course uh, in Russia. Thank you so much, Dr. Ken Rogers in Kelowna. Hopefully that fire will never reach you, Ken. Um, but who knows? Over time, there'll be more. There will always be more fires. Thank you so much.